Okay, welcome to what looks like it's going to be a, another podcast. Um, in this session, I'd like you to come away understanding uh, the basics, the foundation for electroalical chemistry. So that means appreciating that it's a five-step process. It's actually harder to do electrochemistry than one might think. Uh, realize that there are three different kinds of mass transport. Uh, this is also relevant to our impending discussion of separation science. Uh, be able to recognize how a specific analyte will move by mass transport towards an electrode. Uh, describe how electrochemical experiments are categorized and outline what kinds of excitation and response waveforms uh, there are in electrochem. So with that, we'll get going. Electrochemistry, it really is. It's a, it's, it's a challenging process, more challenging than I think uh, I ever uh, understood when I first got involved in it. But it's a five-step process, and you have some material. And the first thing that has to happen is that material must get from bulk solution to the electrode surface. And there are three modes of mass transport, and we'll look at these whereby a material can get transported. And the fact there are three, that complicates matters. So that's an important aspect. Once it gets there, it has to get close enough that the electron can get from the electrode to the material in solution. And generally, we're talking, therefore, about outer sphere electron transfer. Well, you'll learn more about this in uh, Professor Kearse's course. But that means that the two must be like within a nanometer. So it's best if uh, your analyte, O, adsorbs transiently. And the transient part is really important. You don't want it to permanently stick uh, there, uh, bind to the electrode surface, because uh, it will only end up preventing another O from coming and undergoing uh, reduction. So you want it to absorb transiently, and then the electron transfer has to happen. And every uh, a fundamental electrochemical event has an inherent thermodynamic propensity uh, for the uh, charge transfer to occur. It also has a kinetic uh, propensity. And so uh, charge transfer is both about thermodynamics, but it's also about kinetics. And sometimes the kinetics can work against you. And then there are two more steps, which you may not it may not seem like uh, are important, but it turns out they're really critical. Once you've formed R, R's got to get away from the electrode. If it stays on the electrode surface, it's blocking the electrode surface, and it's preventing another O from undergoing reduction. So R's got to desorb. It's got to get away. Um, and it has to get far enough away by mass transport that another O can come in. Okay, So five different events, and fundamentally, the first step is a mirror image of the last one. The second one is a mirror image of the fourth. So fundamentally, there's basically three different steps that are required, but five different events. All right, so let's talk about the three modes of mass transport. Um, diffusion, migration, and convection. Everything diffuses. Doesn't matter if it's small, large, polymer, monomer, um, an element, a compound, uh, whether it's charged or not. Everything diffuses. Um, things move by diffusion due to a concentration gradient, due to the fact there's more of a material present someplace else in solution than the area of interest. So at an electrode surface, you have metal. Um, if you have metal, then you clearly don't have O. So O moves to the electrode surface inherently because the electrode surface is constructed from something very different. So O will move to the electrode surface. When it gets close enough, O will accept an electron to form R. So there's O, and it's picking up an electron from the electrode and now you've got R. But now you start to end up having a lot of R near the electrode surface. That's good and that's bad. Uh, good thing is, as you build it up, as long as R is not stuck, then guess what? 
R will want to diffuse back out into solution. Why? Because in bulk solution you only have O, the material you started with. And so there's a concentration gradient, an inherent concentration gradient for R away from the electrode surface because it's in high concentration at the surface as you produce it and in low concentration in bulk solution. So that aspect of diffusion works for us in terms of doing electrochemistry. Second mode is mass of mass transports migration and there's two things that have to be true in order for a material to migrate. First it's got to have a charge. So if you have a compound and it's neutral then it ain't going to migrate. Second thing is that there has to be an applied electric field. So just sticking a metal in solution is not going to make a charged species migrate. Apply a voltage to that charge to that piece of metal. Now you have an electric field depending on the charge that material will either migrate towards the electrode or away from it. What direction? directions determined by the charge in the species relative to the uh, pot uh, pot applied potential. Opposites attract. It's a coulombic interaction. Um, and the last thing I should say about migration is this is the mechanism whereby uh, charge passes uh, uh, through an electrolyte. So typical electrolytes might be like say sodium and a chloride, the sodium ion, um, if you have a negatively charged electrode will migrate towards that electrode. The chloride anion will migrate away from that electrode. Um, but that's the mechanism whereby um, charge passes due to an electrolyte migration. Third mode of mass transport, convection. And I always think of uh, my childhood and being with my parents in New York City. You have all these people diffusing to work um, at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. And I have a, a strong memory of my parents and I trying to move in one direction and we couldn't. We ended up being carried along by the um, natural eddy of all the New Yorkers, uh, you know, headed off to work. Um, that's convection. When you have diffusion, diffusion sets up a natural eddy or flow of matter in a particular direction and other things um, end up being carried along with that material. So on the slide I've written X in bulk solution. Um, the O will diffuse to the electrode surface. It carries along with it if you wait long enough due to the natural eddy of O um, that's developed due to diffusion, that X. Um, and likewise, you could have some species Y at the electrode surface and as you begin to build up concentration of R due to, due to um, the electron transfer, um, then guess what? That R that diffuses away is going to carry that Y back out into uh, solution. So at long times, and long in electrochem is about 10 seconds, um, then uh, you will have the onset of what's called natural convection. So convection can be natural, um, it can also be mechanical. Mechanical is when you purposely add say a stir bar and you set up this natural, um, this unnatural flow of material in a net direction. So we have three modes of mass transport, diffusion, migration, and convection. So let's take a moment, we'll make sure we're all uh, comfortable with this. And let's take a look at two examples and, and talk our way through how do we identify what modes of mass transport, and there could be more than one, um, are contributing uh, to the current for a particular material. So I've picked two. Copper bis-cyanide, uh, which is a neutral complex. Uh, it's an organometallic compound. So you have carbon copper bonds that are quite strong. So this thing doesn't ionize and uh, copper tetracyanide dianion. And again, that's a, um, uh, it's actually a square planar um, copper uh, uh, complex and it will not dissociate. So if we first focus on the bis-cyanide complex, um, that material will diffuse. Why? It's present in bulk solution. It's not at the electrode. The electrode is 
a different material, platinum or whatever it is, so it will diffuse. <coughs> it can't migrate, and it can't migrate because that complex has no charge, so no migration. It could undergo convection, however, it will likely not because we're using what's written here as quiescent, a quiet solution. That means a solution that's not stirred. And so if you keep your reaction time short and it's a not stirred solution, then you won't have either type of convection occur, natural or unnatural. So the copper bicyanide can only diffuse to the electrode. Now let's talk about the copper tetracyanide dianion. That's a little bit different. It will still, of course, diffuse to the electrode surface. And it um, now will it migrate? Yes. Uh, will it migrate in the direction I would like it to go? No. Um, it's a dianion, and uh, the electrode, as I've depicted it, is negatively charged. Opposites attract, same charges repel. So the migration current, I'll call it I sub M, and differentiate it from the diffusion current I sub D, um, that's going to be in the opposite sense, the opposite direction. So it's going to work against us. Uh, will the material undergo convection? Again, no. Not if it's a quiescent solution and I use short reaction times. So copper bicyanide only diffuses to the electrode surface and copper tetracyanide dianion that will both under experience diffusion towards the electrode but migration away from the electrode. All right, now why is all of this important? Because uh, the equation that governs mass transport is known as the Nernst-Planck equation. It has fundamentally three terms. This equation describes the movement of matter due to these three modes of mass transport. The uh, the flux, the change in concentration of the species as a function of distance. So here's the thing. Um, I can't solve that equation. That's a uh, complex partial differential equation with three different terms. No, it would be great if I could eliminate one or more terms from this equation. In fact, if I could eliminate two, it would actually be analytically soluble. So that's what we're going to set up to talk about now. Is there a way experimentally that I can eliminate one or more components? And in essence with that last problem we've already talked about how we could turn off convection. We can do this practically with two things. Um, not stirring the solution and using short experiment times. So we can turn off convection. We can also suppress migration and here's how we do that. I mentioned about electrolytes earlier. Uh, sodium chloride or potassium nitrate. If you choose materials that are good electrolytes and you add them in high concentration, then your analyte will primarily move by diffusion to the electrode surface and the migration term will be dominated uh, by your uh, electrolyte contribution. So if we eliminate convection and migration, we're left with one term. And the Nernst-Planck equation will reduce to fix laws of diffusion. And so there's two. The first law says the uh, flux of a material is proportional to its concentration. And that's very useful to us. Uh, it's proportional to this diffusion constant term. And fix second law says that the rate of change of concentration, we're analytical chemists and so we're interested in the concentration of a material, um, is uh, uh, how it varies with time. So I, I, if I can ha come up with an analytical solution to how that concentration varies with time, then I can actually uh, uh, um, do something uh, uh, analytically. So it turns out it, um, this equation is analytically soluble if you have well-defined boundary conditions. Boundary conditions are, you know, what's the concentration of your material at time zero? What is it at time t? Um, and, you know, um, things like uh, what's the shape of the electrode? Uh, so we uh, use, for example, uh, rectangular electrodes, call them flags. We often use um, disks. Uh, we call those button electrodes. 
those give well-defined um, uh, boundary conditions uh, and allow us to ultimately solve fixed second law. So for a second I want to talk about D. D is important. It's um, a constant called the diffusion constant. It's a measure of how, uh, how the material, diff how rapidly it, it diffuses to, an elect to the electrode surface. Um, of course it has to be only diffusing in order to measure D. Um, D is important. Um, it can be related to some other important parameters uh, in separation science. Uh, people care about the ion's mobility. Um, that's given the symbol uh, mu here. Uh, we'll talk about ionic mobility uh, once we start talking about separation science. Um, it can also be related uh, to how conductive an ion is. That's lambda. And so there's these two equations, the Einstein equation, the Nernst-Planck, excuse me, the Nernst-Einstein equation that relate the diffusion constant to uh, some of these other parameters. Um, the diffusion constant is something we can actually measure in electrochemistry and if we measure it in electrochemistry it can give us insight into separation science, it can give us insight into electrical conductivity and some other um, interesting things. So very important parameter. So the general approach in electrochem is we try to set our problem up so it's analytically soluble. So um, we design the experiment by using a good electrolyte, adding it at high concentrations so it's um, mass transport limited by diffusion. Uh, we use an electrode of a suitable size and a suitable shape that sets up for us our initial conditions, our boundary conditions, and then it turns out that fixed second law is analytically soluble with Laplace transforms um, and the equations that fall out, uh, those are the basis of the fundamental electrochemical experiments. And so now we're going to talk about how uh, we do electrochemical experiments, uh, what kinds of electrochemical experiments there are and what kinds of information they give us. And we'll ultimately look at three different uh, electrochemical experiments. There are many. Um, all electrochemical experiments boil down to um, Ohm's law, E equals IR, or in physics class you probably learned it as V equals IR. Um, you can either control the potential and measure the current, or you can actually control current, inject charge, withdraw charge, and measure the potential that the system assumes those two different ways of thinking about or attacking um, an electrochemical system uh, form the basis for the two branches, the two main branches of electrochemistry, controlled potential methods and controlled current methods. In controlled potential methods we vary the potential and in controlled current methods we vary the current. And there are a couple of fundamental ways in which we can vary current or potential uh, and uh, the, the ways we typically do this are based on the devices that we have in order to control current and potential and, and in order and to follow current and potential and so we either typically move almost instantaneously from one value to another as a function of time and so this can be oops uh, this can be either potential or it could be current, either variable. But if we change it rapidly uh, from one value to another, that's a step. And the other thing that we can do is we can continuously vary that parameter between two different limits. And again, we can do this both for potential, we can also do it for current. And so the two kinds of excitations, and that's the term that we use to describe these waveforms, what we actually do in the experiment, are either step or ramp. Uh, so step techniques instantaneously changing the variable, ramp linearly increasing or sweeping the variable. And it's possible to do combinations of these steps and ramps and they form the basis for some very powerful electrochemical experiments. All right, 
So electrochemical experiments are characterized by their excitation and their response waveforms. So let's talk about the response waveforms for a moment. There's a couple of characteristic responses uh, that we measure and the names of the experiments typically tell you about what you're doing and what you're measuring. So when you see the term voltammetry, that's telling you something about the response waveform. It's telling you you're measuring a plot of the current that flows as a function of the applied potential, voltammetry. And you can see the word volt right there, unit of um, potential, right in the name. Um, if you have time-based uh, e experiments, then you'll typically see the word chrono something in the name, chrono meaning time. Um, if you choose to measure current as a function of time, then we would call that experiment chronoamperometry. And if we chose to measure charge, the integral of current as a function of time, um, then that would be chronocoulometry. So names of electrochemical experiments often are tied to their function in a very practical way, very helpful way. So as I said, we're going to look at a couple methods. Uh, we'll talk briefly about uh, one of those methods and then we'll talk more about it um, next week. So we're going to talk a little bit about chronoamperometry right now and give you the basis for uh, the response and what you can learn from it. It's a good example of a potential step method. So excitation, I am stepping the potential between two values, E1 and E2. In a potential step method, you choose E1 and E2 so that somewhere in between is E0, the redox potential for the system of interest. If you choose E0, so it's between E1 and E2, then you're going to have an electrochemical event happen. Either the system will be oxidized or the system will be reduced. What will happen depends on what E1 and E2 are. If you step your system from a low voltage to a larger, more positive one, you will oxidize it. And if you step it from a high value to a low value, you will reduce the system. So you can control the, the potential step and choose whether to oxidize a material or to reduce a material. So, so chronoamperometry, we do a step instantaneously oxidizing or reducing the material and then we're going to measure the current that flows as a result. So we do that and we will get the response that you see at lower left. I measure current that flows as a function of time the time when I change the potential instantaneously from E1 to E2 is indicated as T0 on this slide and you'll see all of a sudden there's a spike in the current and then the current dies away exponentially. That response waveform um, follows a particular behavior, it's therefore uh, given a name called the Cottrell equation and the Cottrell equation is written in bright green at upper right the current that flows as a function of time to the minus one half is proportional to NFA D naught to the one half C naught star divided by pi one half. Um, and what that's saying is that if you plotted current as a function of T to the minus one half, you should get a straight line and the slope of that straight line should be a bunch of constants including the area of the electrode the diffusion constant and the concentration of your material. So one of the applications of chronoamperometry is to allow you to measure the concentration of an analyte in solution. Alright, so let's take a look at this, you know, why is the current spike, why is the current die away? Well, at the very start of the experiment you have only O in solution and the O comes to the electrode and all of a sudden um, you have, by diffusion, all of a sudden because you're at the right potential the material gets reduced because you've exceeded the uh, redox potential. So all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of current that flows proportional to how much R you're making 
but now the electrode starts to get a little bit clogged up, more clogged up, more clogged up with product, and so you start to see less and less and less reduction in this particular case, and therefore less current. So that's why the current dies away. Um, if you waited long enough, yes, um, there'll be more O coming to the electrode surface, but remember, convection, there'll be the onset of convection, and that starts to complicate things. Um, you'll end up with a, a response waveform that doesn't look linear in terms of plot of current as a function of time to minus one half. All right, so chronoamperometry, you're instantaneously uh, changing the potential between two limits. You can hold that potential at that new value for a set time period. We call that tau. Um, it's the step size, and you can vary that. Uh, why would you want to vary it? Well, you want to hold it long enough at that new potential that you really can g measure um, the concentration of your material in solution, that you're getting an adequate measure. And that's going to be reflected in the current that you see in the response waveform. So if you didn't wait long enough, you didn't have the right tau, then um, you wouldn't see all the current that you should see in that response waveform. And so you can vary tau, and we'll do this in lab, um, and if it's long enough, then uh, the, the um, slope that you will get for your plot will be a constant. And if you don't wait long enough, then the slope will vary. <laughs> now, it's not the world's greatest experiment. And uh, I want to show you on this slide the nonlinear variations that you'll typically see uh, reflected in the plot that we'll see on the screen in lab. Um, if you do a plot of current as a function of t to the minus one half, and I want you to stop and think about it with me for a second, um, then close to the origin, because it's one over t to the one half, you're talking about long times, one over, you know, big number. And if you're talking about short times, short times are living farther to the right. So you will see nonlinearity both at long times and at short times. At long times, this is the onset of convection. Okay, so you'll see this dashed curve, uh, nonlinear as you get towards the origin, and your intercept won't be zero. Um, at short times, you'll also see a nonlinear effect. And this is due to double layer charging. So I want to talk about this for a sec. A metal electrode isn't really an electrode, although we, we talk about it that way. It's just a piece of metal. When you apply a voltage to it and it acquires a charge and you put it in solution, then it becomes an electrode. An electrode is a double layer of charge. So uh, if you have um, a metal and you apply a voltage to it so it acquires a negative charge in solution you'll end up with um, a layer of cations that will uh, be near the surface and that positive negative double layer of charge that's a capacitor and that's what we really are talking about when we're talking about an electrode. In this experiment it takes a finite amount of time uh, when you change that potential uh, you change the double layer, it takes a finite amount of time for a stable double layer to be set up. And so you'll see nonlinearity reflecting the fact that you are creating this double layer. So uh, in lab, we're going to quickly on the screen um, create this Cottrell plot, and I will give you uh, the slope and the intercept, which we'll, we've already talked about, which will be non-zero. Uh, uh, non and I'll also give you the correlation coefficient, so you can know whether or not you can trust your data in terms of its linearity. And from that, um, you should be able to extract the concentration of your analyte. All right, it, this is not a great experiment. And that's why there are tons of other electrochemical experiments. One of the biggest problems with this experiment is it requires you experimentally to be able to instantaneously change the potential. And that's really, from an experimental standpoint, hard to do. 
um, the signal's largest, it's most reliable at the start of the experiment, and that's your weakest point, um, the, the fact you can't instantaneously change the potential. So how can you overcome this disadvantage? Well, looking at a different response waveform. If instead of looking at a signal that died away, you could look at a signal that builds, then uh, you would have a superior experiment. And that's the basis for the technique known as chronoculometry. Um, chronoamperometry, though, um, it's very uh, widely used. Uh, you'll still see today many papers using chronoamperometry. You can determine the number of moles of electrons involved in a redox process. As unexciting, unappealing as it might sound, you can determine the area of um, your electrode. And this is, this is an important point. Again, uh, analytical chemists, we think deeply about things and we take a great deal of care uh, in our measurements. So we really know what we're talking about. Um, the geometric area of an electrode is often, in point of fact, not the same thing as the actual size of an electrode. When you start to think about a quote-unquote smooth surface from our vantage point, it turns out to be uh, more like the surface of the Earth uh, if you're looking down on it from the sky. There's lots of nooks and crannies. And so the true area of an electrode um, is often much greater than the geometric area. And so electrochemists will typically use a standard like the potassium ferricyanide we use in lab in order to determine the area of their electrode um, using that primary standard before they actually begin to quantitate with that electrode uh, the concentration of some material of interest. Um, if you have a new material, you're beginning to characterize it. It's a quick, easy experiment whereby you can quickly determine D0. So if you have a material that you're able to weigh out accurately so you know the concentration um, and you know the area of the electrode, uh, then you can quickly um, determine D0 from the slope. Um, there are other really cool things you can do with it. Um, it's a really great technique for probing complex reaction mechanisms. Oftentimes in electrochem, you will uh, oxidize a material or reduce a material, and that new material you've generated will do chemistry. And so you can often follow that chemistry uh, uh, with electrochem. Um, and, and, and thereby learn about organic reaction mechanisms. So if you're an organic chemist, that's an important uh, branch of electrochemistry is uh, probing uh, organic reaction mechanisms. Okay, so how do you do um, th uh, this experiment? Well, how do you do controlled potential experiments? Uh, showing you exactly what you're going to see in lab um, you know, on uh, Friday or, or uh, and what those of you who are in lab on Wednesday saw. Um, you have three electrodes we call the working, the counter, and the reference. The two electrodes that make up the cell primarily are the working and the counter. Uh, because we're changing the potential of the working and we're doing it very quickly. We don't talk about um, uh, the electrodes that we use electroanalytically as anodes and cathodes. Instead we talk about controlling the potential of an electrode. Uh, that electrode's the working and the potential at which we, we sample the current um, is the uh, counter and it's called counter or sometimes auxiliary reflecting the fact that that electrode um, ha is going to be um, having the opposite redox process from the process that's occurring at the working electrode. And the reference, we've talked about its purpose before too, um, that's helping us to define what the potential actually means. And in lab, we'll be using a silver-silver chloride reference electrode, and that's a, a widely used practical a reference standard as versus the she that we talked about in lecture. So you'll make up a solution, uh, put it into the beaker. The beaker becomes your uh, electrochemical cell. Uh, we often call it a single compartment electrochemical cell. Um, your potassium ferrocyanide will be in an aqueous solution containing one molar potassium nitrate. That potassium nitrate is your salt your electrolyte, 
it's present uh, in order to ensure um, that there is your analyte is not uh, undergoing migration it's only diffusing to the electrode and uh, water is a great solvent but water is only a great solvent if you add a salt to it so it becomes conductive so those will be your reagents and it'll be a very rapid experiment and that's so that we can uh, turn off uh, natural convection and it'll be quiescent um, so that we are not having any unnatural eddies and flows uh, so there's no convection and how do we control the potential in this experiment well you'll be using a electrochemical workstation um, that is a little bit different than you may have heard of potentiostats and galvanostats a potentiostat controls the potential a galvanostat is designed to control current and today most folks purchase electrochemical workstations they allow you to um, both control potential and control current so you can do many different kinds of electrochemical experiments uh, using an electrochemical workstation you may also read uh, particularly if you're reading about nanoscience about bipotentiostats so I wanted to mention that term the bi means two and uh, sometimes in electrochemistry uh, you'll have uh, an electrochemical array that you'll use and you might change the potential of one electrode and generate a material and then watch it move diffuse and you can sample it at a very close nearby second electrode and it, to do something complex like that requires a bipotentiostat device um, we will uh, have our solution sitting out on the desktop but I will point out to you the Faraday cage and typically electrochemists will uh, put their sample in this great big box to shield it from stray electrical signals particularly important when you're working with small signals small electrodes small signals uh, and so on this slide you're sort of seeing uh, one uh, variation of a uh, Faraday cage 